All right, hello everybody, welcome. This is the BISC brief call for August 22nd. This is the, I guess you could say, successor to our weekly growth calls that we held on Thursday, every Thursday at this time. These calls we are uh, looking to hold every other week now and uh, make them more of a themed event where we have uh, a more carefully considered theme that we treat in more detail. Uh, the goal is to make them more engaging, have more people join, and just generally get more out of it. So last year we had, or last week we had, two weeks ago, last call we had was on the BISC DAO. It was a, I guess, first official update that we had on the DAO since it launched back in April. Just went through some figures and uh, our experience with the DAO over the past four months that, it, that, it's, been, that it's been live. This week, we're gonna talk about contributing. Uh, BISC needs more contributors, more developers, more uh, just resources to help out with growth. Um, and so we'll talk more, we'll talk about that. Uh, let me share my screen so that you can see the rough plan for the call. Uh, okay. All right, so you should be able to see it now. You guys see the screen? Yeah, works for me. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, just uh, high level, three points to guide the discussion. I wanna talk about BISC as a project, what makes it different from your typical open source uh, project. Let me follow that with uh, available work. So what is there actually to do uh, if you decide that you do want to contribute and help out the project, what is there to do? Development is like the big thing that we need help with, um, experienced senior developers, um, but there's also plenty of opportunities for folks who are not developers. And then um, if you decide that there is something that you'd like to do, then we can talk about getting started. How do you actually become a part of uh, the project? How do you contribute? How do you get started? And uh, offer something of value. So that's the rough idea. Uh, it's great to see a lot of people join. Looks like we have 20 people on the call right now, which I think might be a record. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining and feel free to jump in. Like I said before, this is a conversation. We want it to be interactive. If you are shy or don't want to, uh, to talk, feel free to just post a, a message in the chat. Jump in whenever you like so we can uh, cover your concerns, cover your questions. Um, I, want to, I want to make this call as thorough of a, of a treatment on contributing to BISC as possible. We have a doc or two on it. We have some guidance elsewhere, but nowhere where we actually interact with people and discuss concerns uh, up front. So we have, we've got several contributors on the call right now. We have folks, we've got developers, we've ha we have uh, some translators, we have some people who work on docs on the website, uh, some conceptual uh, input as well, Manuel. Uh, we have a, a designer, Pedro looks like is here. Um, Wiz has done a lot of uh, DevOps development, a um, whole bunch of stuff for us uh, just in the past couple of weeks. So uh, we should have lots of resources to answer your questions and um, hopefully get you started if you're interested. So BISC as a project. Um, I have a couple of points to talk about here. Um, the main one being in terms of what makes it different. Uh, it's a project that I think of as one that's, that's good for the world that you can work on and get paid at the same time. Usually those are two different things. You get paid to work on crap, or if you work on something you really like, you're not gonna get paid. Uh, BISC, in my opinion, is software that's good for the world, it's good for the Bitcoin space. Um, and because of its built-in uh, revenue model, which we call the BISC DAO, which you may have heard of, um, you can actually get paid uh, for your contributions on the project. It's quite an elegant setup, I think. Um, anyone have uh, any other perspectives of what they think of as making BISC different or maybe why you contribute on it? I guess another, another point I can mention is that the challenges are quite novel. Uh, we'll talk probably more about this when we talk about the opportunities for developers, but the 
challenges that BISC faces as a decentralized, uh, as decentralized software to enable trading of, of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is, uh, I mean, you're not going to find them anywhere else. I mean, the issues that we're trying to solve with respect to getting rid of arbitrators, for example, there are other non-KYC Bitcoin exchanges or formerly non-KYC Bitcoin exchanges that uh, use or used arbitrators to solve disputes. BISC does this right now. Um, but in order for BISC to be hardened as much as possible in the future, in the near future, hopefully, arbitrators are going to have to go away. And so we're going to have to figure out a way to secure trading between two parties without a third party having any possible influence, uh, which is this, the topic of our new trade protocol that we're developing right now. We've got a lot of conceptual work already done, but we need more conceptual work. We need more development uh, to, to, make it a, to make it a reality. Um, any other folks want to jump in on, on what, you, uh, what you see as different, maybe what you find interesting about the project, what, you, what surprises you about the project? Hi, I'm Jordi. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I was wondering, like, I discovered BISC about, let's say, one month, two months ago. Okay. And then I started using it and I bought some Bitcoins. And I was like, this is really cool. And it's a project that uh, the world really needs. <laughs> and it's on the spirit of, uh, of Bitcoin. But uh, right now, one of the last sentences that you said is that you are trying to achieve the decentralized uh, exchange without uh, mediators. Like when there is a problem, like there is no one interacting. Like it's only the two who are in exchanging the money, the ones who solve the problem by themselves. Is that yeah. really possible? Like, do you know other projects that do that? Or, you know, is, is it possible like to, to create that kind of protocol? It's conceptually possible. I mean, we have, uh, we have a rudimentary conception of a trade protocol whereby instead of a two, two of three multi-sig, it's a, it's a two of two multi-sig. And any disputes are first handled by the traders on their own if they can, if they can come up with a solution. Um, and if they can't, if it's a deeper problem, then a mediator steps in. So mediators and arbitrators are, we think of as two different kinds of people. An arbitrator actually has a third uh, key, whereas a, sec a, uh, a mediator does not have any key in the multi-sig and their influence in the trade is, is minimal. Um, so there's, this is a big topic. There's a lot of complexity to talk about, but uh, we like to think it is possible and we're working on, on ways to make it, uh, to make it, to implement it. Um, but uh, yeah, we need, we need more, more conception, more, more clear conception to make it work. A clear technical spec once we have the conception down and then the resources to actually implement it once all of that is done. Yeah, maybe I jump in here quickly. So there are actually two new ideas for trade protocols. One is the one which Steve described, which is basically a replacing the arbitrator with a mediator and the security is handled over the DAO. We don't have time probably to discuss this deeper here, but there is a proposal where you can read up the documentation about the concept on our proposals repository on GitHub. And then there is a second one where, uh, where we want to go off chain from Bitcoin. So the trade protocol will be completely off chain and the security will be based on, on a bond in the DAO. It's also too complex to go into the details, but that's uh, even more interesting, but even a little bit more future. And it's also written up in their proposal. So if, yeah, maybe the best is to just uh, check out on the proposals uh, page what's already there. And if you want to know more, so just get in touch and, and we can go deeper to this. Okay, I will do the homework and, and read those proposals. Thank you. Can I ask one thing? Do we have history of the, the, arbitra the arbitrations that have happened in BISC? Do you mean like the, 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 the most common issue? What's the most common 
calls or things like that? Uh, not not official, but uh, um, we know it basically from the arbitrators uh, when they worked for longer. What was I mean from my experience? I've been arbitrating in the early days. Mm -hmm. uh, there most yeah, I would say thirty percent are bugs, thirty percent are user mistakes, and thirty percent are bank issues, troubles with banks that they are slow or whatever, or even less, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, real disputes that people are trying to cheat, cheat each other, that one say I send you the money and the other, no, I've not received them, one is lying, is close mm -hmm. to zero. It's super rare because basically they have no chance. So they okay. don't try those so things. Close to zero. I don't remember oh. any case when I was arbitrator actually. All right, thanks. Cool. All right, so that was the intro. What makes this different? What's uh, why you might be interested? Uh, what kind of challenges you're likely to face? Uh, certainly as a developer, but but also as a as a non-developer. I mean, I, I personally have been more on the communication side, doing more uh, documentation, speaking, presenting, that kind of thing, and explaining the DAO to a room full of people who are either totally against anything that's not called BTC or, or, or anything that's got the word or the term DAO in it is, is a challenge for sure. So you're likely to be challenged uh, no matter what you're doing. Um, I, yeah, yeah, Steve, maybe one more thing regarding uh, the difference. Um, if you're working on BISC, sure. which, which is interesting for me at least, um, that you're working on pro problems on the conceptual side and also on the technical side that you um, rare, rarely um, have in other projects. So it's it just because of its uh, decentralized nature, um, how it is structured. Um, yeah, so that's, that's for me the interesting part because yeah, uh, I don't know any other project where you can have this first-hand experience how, how a, a non-company can, can work and uh, still also fund development. Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's, a, that's a very good point. You're, you're going you're gonna to be, yeah, I guess challenged not just in your work, but also in the, the, the occasional need to, to do something that you're not used to doing, to reach into a different discipline or a different uh, function and make the best of it. Yeah, so on um, that topic, maybe we can talk about... Uh, can I just add something else? Oh, that's yeah. Something that excites me particularly is that you get to not only work on a project that has, I believe, very big potential to kind of influence the, the whole Bitcoin sphere, but you also are enabled to earn Bitcoin in the most, one of the most private ways. You, you don't need, the, you can work anonymously, get a, an address for receiving BSQ anonymously and convert that into Bitcoin totally anonymously. Anything, you, not even the, the people that accept your proposal know your name. And I mean, anything that's way more, anything that's more anonymous in this besides mining, I, I, I don't even know. Because even if you're like running a, a website with a BTC pay server or something, even that's somewhat tied to your identity. But with BISC and the BISC token, it's nobody needs to know who you are as long as you're providing valuable work yeah that's an excellent point actually there's there's a there's a number of contributors we have to the project where i mean i i have no idea who they are and <laughs> probably close to impossible to find out um i i think one thing i want to add to that is the just a vision for bisque in one line i mean we, i think it, it's important to like it's very easy to say that BISC is just another decentralized exchange um, but in many ways, it's not even an exchange. It's just software that provides a service like an exchange. And I think uh, it's, from what I've seen following the project for well over a year and a half now, um, I haven't seen a single instance of compromise. Like, oh, you know, it, it would have been nice to do this. Um, but we had to make the sacrifice on privacy or the sacrifice on security. I haven't seen that ever, not even once. And I know Chris Beams told me this a while back, one of the co-founders of BISC from the early days. Uh, you know, his, his vision for BISC was for it to become 
V on ramp or off ramp for for Bitcoin. Um, it's that pure in its vision and what it's trying to achieve. And um, I just think that's a great thing. And it's something that's very exciting to be working on. Uh, all right, so to that end, available work. If you want to contribute to BISC and you're a developer or not, not a developer, regardless, whatever the case is, um, what, what can you do? So I think development is probably the first one we should talk about because of how important it is to the project. Uh, would a developer want to step in maybe and talk about some of the, the top priorities for the project right now? Yeah, maybe, maybe I do it. Uh, yeah, the top priority is one part is uh, people are working on it. Uh, that's this account signing, which is basically a solution for this issue what we had back in April with uh, stolen bank account scammers. And then we had to decrease the trading limit for new users to, uh, yeah, to keep out the scammers again. And uh, so far it works. But of course, it's not fun to just trade with uh, 0.01 Bitcoin. And uh, this feature with account signing gives us back the security against, against such uh, criminals and will enable it again to, uh, to increase the trading limits. Um, yeah, it's in the work. So hopefully in the next two months or so, it gets uh, finished. Uh, then the next biggest priority is uh, the new trade protocol. And as I said before, there are basically two uh, ideas for new trade protocol. Probably we will. Uh, use both. Uh, it's probably not the right place here to get in any details, but both are quite exciting. For, yeah, the first one where we replace the arbitrators with the mediators will make BISC much more censorship resistant and decentralized. And the second one will be um, the main benefit will be that uh, we, we don't need uh, mining fees anymore for the trades. At the moment, the trade contains four transactions and when mining fees become expensive at some point again, uh, then yeah, trading on BISC will become more expensive just from the mining fee. And this new off-chain trade protocol doesn't require any Bitcoin transaction and gives a lot of privacy as well because it's off-chain and gives a lot of flexibility and user experience improvements because you can make the transaction as fast as you can transfer the funds. You don't need a blockchain confirmation. It has tons of uh, benefits, uh, but yeah, that's. Uh, I think yeah, those are the most important uh, features what we need to get done, and uh, then there are many many other projects where I probably get, would get lost to just uh, start to talk about them, and just to make also the software more solid, fix bugs, uh, improve usability, uh, get the APIs done. Yeah, there's tons of work because when I think we would need at least between five and 10 full-time developers just to get the important stuff done. And we could easily uh, uh, ed, uh, entertain uh, 10 to 20 full-time developers with their ideas and the work which is in the pipeline and what, yeah, what, what should be done at some point. Cool, could we actually, I, I meant to ask this before, could we get a quick uh, indication of how many people on the call are looking for, or potential developers? And how many people are looking for like non-developer work? Just to get a quick idea. I don't know if you wanted to send a quick note in the chat or if you can raise your hand if that's possible. Yeah, uh, and maybe we could also go through the questions on the chat because uh, chat has a lot of interesting questions. Oh yeah, I should, I should do that. Uh, Bernard, you have probably followed the chat. Uh, do you want to pick out any question? Yeah, that'd be best because I, I- To read I'm, everything, it's already quite long. Yeah, sure. So, uh, what frameworks uh, do we use? What languages? Uh, so, those are questions that developers ask. Do you want to answer it? <laughs> sure. There's just like only Java. It's purely Java-based uh, uh, desktop application, and uh, for the UI layer, we use JavaFX, and that's it. And then we just have some. So, no frameworks a part of. JavaFX, and we use uh, a few libraries like Bitcoin J. Uh, yeah, so one framework is choose for dependency injection. Or, but yeah, we are trying to avoid big frameworks also to not get too much dependencies. 
for security reasons and also for being lightweight as far as possible. And on there, yeah, beside the Bitcoin J library, uh, SPV per library for getting the Bitcoin blocks and transactions, um, we are using NetLayer, which is a library which uh, enables to route all the traffic over Tor. So it does all the setup for Tor, and so the user don't need to do anything, and also the developer actually don't see anything from Tor. That's all hidden in this library. And uh, anything else? Um, I think those are the main libraries. Then we use a smaller library, a RPC library, for talking to Bitcoin Core when you run a DAO full node. But that's, uh, most people don't do this. So it's not really uh, very important for most. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Manfred. Yeah. Uh, there is also a uh, question. I yes? have a question related with this. Um, that it's uh, how coupled is the Java application, like the, the Node and BIS protocol, and the UI. Like how, how hard would it be to to decouple that, for example, to have um, um, a phone app, for example, like an, an app for the smartphone that uses BISC? Also, as a, I mean, to run the current BISC application, mobile has a lot of challenges, which are mostly resource and usability challenges and not technical one, but even technical one, of course. But when you, I mean, the main thing is that you have to be online when you're a maker, so it doesn't really, yeah, on the phone, you cannot keep the application online all the time. It will uh, drain your battery. And to run our application over Tor, which is consuming also the, uh, over Bitcoin J, uh, yeah, new blocks and so on, it's quite resource intensive. I mean, it can work with uh, very modern and, and uh, powerful phones, uh, but I think it's not our main uh, focus. I mean, there is some work from Bernard uh, with the API, and he has started also a mobile application where it's basically you have somewhere your BISC application running on a server or at home, as a headless application, and then you can basically remote control uh, this application from your mobile phone. Another thing is security. When you have, yeah, you don't want to have too much Bitcoin on your mobile phone, probably. Uh, privacy, another issue. So it's not it's not on our short time um, roadmap, basically, to build a full uh, version of BISC mobile. Theoretically, it could work at least on Android on. I, on iOS, there's another technical challenge because uh, Tor uh, cannot be used in the way how we are using it, at least. And there is also no official Tor implementation for iOS. Um, so, yeah. And to decouple the UI, you probably refer to more HTML, JavaScript based approaches, was not the design goal when I started it. And uh, also, code wise, it's decoupled, uh, but uh, to basically have a server client application like in OpenBazaar where the UI is uh, the client and then you have running a server wouldn't make life easier and deployment, uh, I mean, they had a lot of troubles to get to get it everything running for that it works on every operating system and deployed and so on. So I'm... If I could just I'm add something to that really quick. I think the future of uh, running BISC on your mobile phone is going to be a more distributed architecture where everyone has a Raspberry Pi or home router in their house at home and using the uh, new API that's being developed now it would be a lot uh, it would make a lot more sense to just have your mobile application remotely connect to your full node running at home something like this yeah exactly yeah that's uh, the same direction as well. Okay, yeah, knowing that there is an API and it's the couple, so I can, for example, like someone else can write another front end for B the BISC uh, app, for example. Yeah, well, yeah. basically, I mean, there have always been ideas for people who want to make a more simple version and then they are basically their front end exchange, but are, you are not solving, are you getting into the trouble when you scale up? That you can do as long as you don't have many traders. When you have more traders, then the regulators will require KYC and you cannot hide because you are a company running this server. And I mean, as soon as you have a server, you can shut you down point. So I mean that we are doing this all over tour and it's 100% easy.
key, or not 100%, but as far as possible decentralized because yeah, the arbitration rent is a, one of the issues that we need to get uh, rid of. Uh, that's just a long-term survival requirement. Otherwise, it will not survive in that form. Or they force you to KYC and then there's no reason to use BISC, then you go to CoinBISC and it's easier and faster and whatever. So, yeah, yeah. people can do it, of course. I mean, it's... For BISC, it's just another user. If you run a web page, basically, and you have your own customers who are using BISC in the backend, uh, but you will get into troubles when you're getting bigger. And to plan a project where you know you cannot become bigger, it can only work as long as it's not relevant because there are not many users. It doesn't really make more, much sense. Yeah. So clearly, there's a, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of work to do for in, in the development realm. Um, if you, well, we'll talk a little bit more about how to get involved in the getting started section, um, next, but I guess for now, uh, if you're short on time, best way is to just get in touch with us on Slack. Uh, the, the URL for the Slack, uh, maybe someone can put it in the chat. Um, but just, I guess, get in touch there, follow the GitHub, uh, get familiar with the code, um, and just kind of, I guess, pinpoint issues and things, bugs. Uh, features that you want to add or initiatives that you want to get involved with and um, and just kind of work your way in that way. Um, I want to I want to move quickly to the non-development work just because I know a lot of people are probably waiting. We've got seemed like we had a good mix of developers and non-developers on the call. Uh, so non-development work uh, is mainly growth, I think, uh, in the form of marketing and and just growth to late liquidity. Um, as we've mentioned, it's a bit of a kind of a touchy kind of, I don't know, weird topic right now because of the limitations on, on, uh, on trading for people who created accounts after March 1st, basically new users, uh, which hobbles growth efforts in fiat. Um, but yeah, I mean, those I think are mainly an issue in established markets, us, Europe. Um, but in new markets, I don't think those are an issue, at least right now. I don't think we, impl we implement those limitations. So places in Asia, South America, um, wherever, uh, are, are fair game. Uh, the challenge that we found is that it's kind of hard to start new markets if you don't have a physical presence there. And um, at least that's what we found so far. So ideas on how to do that, possibly get around that limitation, uh, or, you know, um, cohesive strategies to do that uh, would be would be great. Marketing to go along with that. I don't think anyone, at least that I know of, who's an active contributor to BISC is has a, a strong background in marketing. I certainly don't. So um, anybody who has that kind of background, um, caveat there is that BISC is very much a privacy oriented uh, project that goes about marketing in a bit of a different way. And so that's something that we'd want to keep in mind with any kind of new marketing initiative. But yeah, ideas are welcome around there. Contributions are welcome there. And yeah, the other topics I have there, web, um, that's referring to the website, also referring to some of the other web-oriented items that are part of the project. So I think the, the BSQ block explorer that shows the BSQ transactions, um, I believe I saw that uh, there was some... Uh, help would have been appreci would be appreciated there on improving it, possibly hosting it, um, and translations. I think we have a good handle on that, but I know that there was some help in Vietnamese and Thai that was specifically uh, requested there. And yeah, I mean, this this is, is is very much it's a company that's not a company. And so anything you would need uh, to, to run an operation with revenue and, you know, it, 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 it could poss possibly be useful. So if, we, if there's something we haven't mentioned that you think the network could use that you could provide, just, you know, talk to us about it, approach, you know, approach someone in the project, the Slack, uh, whatever, and, uh, you know, make a proposal discuss the idea and you never know, maybe uh, the network will find it useful and you could, uh, you could contribute it. 
Uh, there was someone who just mentioned a link in the chat. It's the contributor checklist. It's hosted on our docs website. I highly recommend folks who are interested in contributing to check it out. It's docs.disc.network slash contributor dash checklist. That has a list of resources on uh, the just helpful resources on the philosophy behind BISC and collaboration in BISC and uh, just how to get started, uh, practical ways to do that. Websites, calendars, the GitHub, all the links that you would need to follow and, and, and access are all there. So highly recommend checking that out. It's in the Slack. Steve? Yeah. Okay. So beyond uh, marketing and growth, I think a, a place that also needs help, it's uh, the managing the, the overall information about BISC or, for example, keeping track of compensations or, or devi devising new ways to, to evaluate the work and stuff like that. I don't know what bracket that falls under, but I think that also needs help. So maybe the more operational side of, of uh, keeping the, the network of contributors running smoothly? Yes, and stuff like, uh, for example, the recent uh, voting on the trading fees. I think that went mm -hmm. a bit uh, unannounced to everybody else that isn't on GitHub and stuff like that that people need to know about, but they don't necessarily know where to find the information. Yeah. Yeah. That so same point. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually an important area where maybe was missing so far that we would also need more people in the support area. Like we have also the BISC forum where usually users who have any problems, they're asking questions and so on. And there are some guys around and so on helping, but yeah, there we could need more support as well. And the same with, uh, yeah, with uh, helping people when they are in Slack, there's tons of information and so, but it's a little bit hard to find the way through the jungle. And um, if anybody, I mean, we, we don't have really, or we don't want to get too much overhead, like in a company or whatever. Uh, it should be, should stay in this uh, yeah, open source project style. And basically most stuff should be just documented and then there is a docs page which is explaining what we have already a lot, thanks to all the work Steve has done and Chris Beams earlier. Uh, but uh, it still needed a lot of human work. It still needs a lot of human work to uh, yeah, to bring the new people together, to route them to the correct resources, and also to get a little bit of direct contact because, I mean, the human thing is important. We don't want to have a DAO as a kind of like a machinery which is uh, running the project automatically without uh, the, the people being really in touch. Yeah, those are good points. I think the, the, the hope for the DAO, at least from my end, is that it's, uh, you know, it takes place of your, your formalized company and corporate hierarchy and enables a large measure of freedom for the people who are who are working who are you know contributing to it but the flip side to that is managing all of it so that it's not a big you know confusing mess um because the flip side of freedom is it, it can be chaos and so definitely need uh, some attention conception maybe some new fresh ideas on how to how to keep this network into a uh, you know cohesive force to make the whole project go forward. Jeez. And I think one challenge in such a environment is that uh, when there are no hierarchies and when there are no clear roles, and so I mean for some things we have roles like a GitHub maintainer or so, but for many things there are no clear roles. So basically everybody is welcome to help to improve things but people feel a little bit lost. They are not sure how much they should push forward and so on, or how much basically yeah, uh, responsibility they are willing or able to take. And then it can end, and we have seen this in the past, it ends often a little bit in the way that nobody feels responsible because everybody is expecting that somebody else is doing it or so. So to have a little bit more help on this kind of like 
management or uh, communications area or project manager to drive projects forward, like the new trade protocol. They were basically missing somebody who really pushed this forward over the last months. And I think that's uh, something what we have to uh, try to solve, uh, either by dedicated persons or by people who are already active as developers or whatever, and who are taking a little bit more these roles. Um, but I think we have to also emphasize that, at least from my point, to not get too far in overhead and that we have then whatever five people who are just delegating and then it's only one guy who is really getting the work done. Like very often in companies that uh, three management levels are not really working and when they are gone, basically the developer would be more efficient. <laughs> At least that's a little bit of experience from my past jobs sometimes. Yeah, we want management to happen without the managers, basically, uh, which you know, hopefully, hopefully is not impossible. But I guess to that end, uh, we could maybe jump into getting started. How do you actually do it? Um, I think for all intents and purposes, it's, it's, it's an open source project. So you can see everything, you can see all the activity on, on GitHub, the chats happen in public on Slack, and you know, support happening in real time on the forum. And so from my perspective, I would encourage people to follow the areas that pertain to what you want to do. And just get involved, get, get uh, familiar with the initiatives and the, the, the way that work is done and just familiarize yourself with the, pro the way the project works. And then once you've identified areas that you think you could contribute to, propose ideas, propose um, you know, things that you think you could do to push that initiative forward and Propose them to the community, propose them to people who are involved with that particular initiative, see what they think, get feedback, and just do the work. Um, the one thing I would say that I've seen new contributors do wrong, if that's the right word, there's, it's kind of hard to do anything wrong, but doing things in a not suboptimally is just kind of either like doing things without anybody knowing beforehand um, is probably the biggest thing. It, it really helps. I mean, you don't need permission from anybody to do anything for BISC, but you also have to keep in mind that in order to be compensated for your work, people have to think that what you did is valuable to vote positively on your compensation request. So making people aware of what you're doing and getting buy-in for whatever it is you do want to do is very important if you want to be if you want to be compensated that's i guess the main idea behind the DAO is that it's permissionless but um there's a mutual understanding that what people are doing is is valuable for the network so that's one one point i would make uh any other any other contributors want to any any uh, ideas on on advice for for new contributors getting yeah buy i can yeah, I can speak from the developer perspective. Sure. I think it's good to go to the BISC issues and tackle some small bug or uh, some small enhancement. So something that needs as little coding as possible uh, so that you can create the pull request, see uh, how many cycles it will require with the code reviews, when it will get merged, and ask for compensation for this thing. And this will get you involved and into communication with others uh, really smoothly. Uh, and I would discourage you from like jumping into huge topics uh, in the beginning because um, I think, uh, well, you those things require um, uh, require you to advertise to get the consensus from the community before you invest too much in your uh, in in this work because it might turn out that those changes are too risky and they might not be accepted too fast uh, and uh, apart from the fact uh, that you said uh, Steve that the community uh, should uh, feel that this is important uh, also the uh, the maintainers, the code GitHub maintainers, are like the first uh, gatekeepers that uh, that will probably 
that might say no to you uh, for some for some reason, and it is very good to in case of those bigger tasks to have really good communication up front. And another advantage, uh, if you're picking as a developer, smaller issues is that you can try out and get compensated uh, for the first time and see, yeah, uh, my work is really paid uh, because yeah, before you're not getting compensated, you're doing work for free as as in in all open source projects, and and that's a big difference. So if you if you get for the first time BSQ and you see, hey, I can I can pay my trading fees with the BSQ or I can sell them to the traders. Um, yeah, that makes it uh, out of sudden um, um, an interesting opportunity to work more and on bigger tasks. Yeah, and and also one thing regarding the issues, um, maybe also just uh, write um, before you start working on these issues. Just write a short command uh, that you are interested and ping one of the GitHub maintainers. It's SQ, Florian, or myself, and then we'll assign the issue. So not two uh, are working on the same issue. It, it's ra rarely the case that two will work at the same time, but yeah, just to be sure. Compensation is uh, in BSQ, that's the, the token that on, on which uh, the DAO runs on. I just uh, read the group chat background. Yeah, I think it's worth noting. Those are good points, both of you guys. Uh, but I think it's worth noting for people who don't know BSQ, it's the token that's, that's built into BISC and um, it's, it's used by traders to pay trading fees. Um, and so traders are the people mainly who buy BSQ uh, from contributors who've earned it. And uh, we've, I don't know the, size, the numbers on the amounts that have been sold, but uh, contributors have sold lots of BSQ uh, over the past four months that it's been in trading. So it's very much realistic that the, what you earn for your work can be uh, can be converted into you know, real real money. Okay, I have a question related with this. Um, the, basically, the uh, the BSQ, BSQ um, coins are colored uh, bitcoins. Correct. And they are like the support that they get are from the trading, no, the volume that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, has, which is this volume more or less right now? How much? Yeah. I think it's 19 million US dollars this month. Roughly, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so the, the trading fees are a percentage of that. Okay, do you know that the, like, the percentage is uh, variable or it's the it's same? Well, it's been I, I, it's, since, oh, sorry. sorry. Since the last change, I think it's roughly 0.4%. But not all um, trading fees are paid with BSQ right now, so that you can pay with Bitcoin and with BSQ. Uh, I do think BSQ is more uh, than 50%, or maybe let's say even more than 60%, but I don't have the correct, uh, the right numbers. Christoph? Yeah? I've been looking at the data, and I think in number, it's around 80 percent because i think it's mostly the monero traders that are using bsq so in number it's around 80 plus percent but in volume i don't i don't know exactly but i think yeah, it's in in, in in the in the regarding volume if it's uh, used uh, by the monero guys then it would be also the the big yeah, it's so, quite a big uh, difference already when you make a two Bitcoin trade with Monero, which are a lot of the trades there. It costs roughly $80 with BSQ as a, as a taker and $120 or $130 with Bitcoin, so $50 difference. So that's a big incentive for traders to use BSQ to get cheaper fees. And I mean, there total, I just opened my application to give a little bit overview. Uh, so that yeah, the price is quite stable, roughly around $1, going up and down, of course, all the time a little bit, but it seems like a stable coin, of course, that's not the intention and not the concept at all. But I think it's because most developers or the developers before we launched, as nobody knew the price, we just said, yeah, we need to have a consensus how we are valuing a 1BSQ, so we said it's $1. And 
for this, most of the developers who are contributors who have earned BSQ are not selling it below one dollar because yeah, when you get basically the promise that this what you get paid has the value of one dollar, you are sticking with this. And now it will take a while until the market really finds out what's the yeah, what the market thinks uh, the correct prices. And I think, yeah, we burned already something like 70,000 or yeah, 74,000 BSQ. That was in the beginning very, uh, very little because when we started, the BSQ fee was super low to incentivize pe people to move to BSQ because it was completely new and was extra effort. You need to buy BSQ. Uh, with Bitcoin, you don't need to do this. Uh, but yeah, over the time we adjusted it to 0.4% of the whole, so 0.4% of the trade amount is the trading fee roughly. And I think now we are getting probably soon to the point where per month there are more BSQ burned like we are issuing. Also the contributors who work for the project with their compensation requests, this money gets created like the central bank is printing money out of nothing. Uh, BISC is basically uh, printing money for the work that has been done and the burnt BSQ are destroyed so yeah you have on one side their inflationary side with creating new BSQ and on the other side the deflationary side with burning BSQ by trading fees and depending what the stronger is basically then um, if the total amount of BSQ goes up or down the total amount of BSQ I think is roughly 3.8 million currently or 3.727 million uh, but that will change with every month basically with the burn and the issuance rate is all this information public like there is any dashboard that people yeah, can yeah, you, you can see this all in the BISC uh, application under the DAO menu there is facts and figures there you have the dashboard and the supply and transactions so all this data is public or and in the, so on the market and trades, you can see how much BSQ was traded. BSQ is basically like an altcoin in BISC from the trading perspective. So you select uh, BSQ as trades and there you see, let me look what the months. The first month was 10 Bitcoins, the second was seven Bitcoins, the third month was nine Bitcoins. Now we are around five Bitcoins what have been traded this month. And yeah, so the, yeah, you can see the trading activity basically and how long it takes when you want to sell BSQ. You have to have a little bit patience because the market is still young and there are not so many users yet uh, buying and selling. But usually I think when you have a fair price, uh, uh, roughly around this $1, you're able to sell it in a few days or so depending on the amount, but uh, what you earn per month should be should be not a problem to sell it also in a few days or in, in one or two weeks at least. Yeah, you might not get a sale immediately, but you will you will get a sale and be able to sell what you want within a reasonable time frame. Yeah, also from the total amount, yeah, it's something like, let me go back again. Uh, the total volume is 35 Bitcoin. So that's 300, with a current price, 350,000. Um, dollar or uh, yeah so that's what has been sold on the market and the issue how much we've issued in total uh, 144,000 BSQ which is roughly $144,000 so they are basically more than two times uh, the, the volume was more than two times higher like what we've issued in this time so 350,000 versus 140,000 so does anyone, before people start dropping off, because we're running almost an hour now, um, does anybody, any potential contributors have any questions that they'd like to ask that we didn't talk about or any stuff you'd like to know about? I have yet another one. So if nobody wants to ask, I, <laughs> I have like some more questions. Is there any other way to contribute like economically? There are things like in the infrastructure side for monitoring that we actually need service to run that. So is there any, like, and it, those servers cannot be paid with Bitcoins, no? We need to pay with a credit card. So like, is anyone centralizing that part, let's say, or 
there are any plans on that? Or for example, with uh, someone owns the um, the URLs, the domains. No? Like, is there any way to, to pay for that if I want to donate or to help? So the costs for these services are usually very low, so it's basically not really relevant. Uh, for seed nodes, uh, it's usually run by developers and it requires some development or uh, operational skills. So um, if anybody, it's a little bit of trusted role and that's uh, all for all trusted roles in BISC where the operator of this role could create some damage either by, by uh, being a bad actor or by just being careless. Uh, People should set up a bond. We have not implemented it uh, 100% yet, but there are already a few bonds, like for uh, for Bitcoin nodes, uh, there are some bonds already set up, and for being a, a GitHub maintainer or a GitHub admin. Uh, but also for seed nodes at some point, the people should uh, lock in a bond. A bond is kind of like a security deposit, which is locked in. So in this time, it could be confiscated from the DAO. So when you run a seed node and you just don't care and you're not available, you're not fulfilling your duties, basically, then the community or the BSQ stakeholder could vote on confiscating your bond when it has created some damage for the project. Also, the web page, the BISC, uh, uh, network uh, domain is, uh, is bonded because, yeah, we have seen with Roger Ware, with the Bitcoin.com domain, how much damage he has created. So that's... Uh, that's an area where damage can be created for the project and then it should be bonded. And that's usually uh, all these bonded roles or these trusted roles are a little bit based on reputation. So when a completely new contributor comes, it's not so, yeah, it's not good to give them these roles because we don't want to get so far to really need the, the, um, the bonds to, uh, yeah, to burn a bond. So when somebody wants to attack the project at some point, I mean, Hopefully we are still far away from that level, but in Bitcoin that happened for sure. Uh, yeah, it's better to filter it out earlier so that we only give people these bonded roles or these uh, trusted roles who are already known and where we have basically no reason to think that this is a, either an unreliable person or a malicious person. Uh, um, just one thing, Manfred, um, because I'm not sure if I understood it correctly what uh, Positive Blue wanted to, to ask. Uh, do, did you say how to contribute economically, uh, so like kind of to pay for stuff? Because if it's that, then there is already a great decentralized solution. You, you, just, uh, you can just buy BSQ on, on the market and then uh, you probably buy it from people who are uh, running seed nodes or Bitcoin core nodes or Tor relay nodes. Um, yes, yeah, so, so if that's, that's what you are asking. Sorry, Manfred, for... for yeah, no, it's good, right? because I think it was moving too far away from the original question. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it was a really good point, Christopher. I got another so suggestion. It's a way to help. Yeah, I mean, the BSQ token is a unit of work done on BISC. I mean, so yeah, if you if you want to contribute to the project economically, that's probably the minute that, that that's the best thing you can do. Buy and also buy, yeah, but you buy. can also try bootstrapping a market or just provide liquidity. Right. Yeah. Sure. And uh, by by holding a token, you're a, you're a shareholder and you're a decision maker because with uh, in the DAO in the voting, you need some BSQ to be uh, to be able to vote. People only should vote on stuff what they really know about and following, or to not random vote or whatever opinions. Uh, but if you're interested in a project, it's basically this idea that uh, all the users and the people who are working on it and who are caring about the project. They are controlling and managing the project and owning it because yeah, the revenue gets over the trading fee distributed in a way to all the stakeholders. Did you have another question? Positive blue? Or anyone else? Probably want to wrap up soon. Uh. Yeah, the trade volume is roughly at the moment 19 million US dollars. I was I was a question in the in the mm -hmm. group chat. Yeah, I posted in the chat also uh, some links to uh, some GitHub issues which are marked as good first uh, issue and others as bound issues. 
those have been basically marked in the past uh, yeah, for new developers. The bounty issues are usually more important, but we really would like to get done. And uh, yeah, the first good issue are easier task for new uh, developers. Uh, there, unfortunately, we didn't maintain it very well over the last month. So the best is basically to get in touch with some developers and, and ask directly. I mean, for getting everything set up in the docs folder in the in the Swiss code is basically everything defined, and then on the docs page on the on the web page of um, there there is additional as in this um, in this uh, checklist for a new contributor there are the other links. So best is to start from there, and then when you get a little bit further, uh, then get in touch with developers and, and check out. And I think it's important to also to mention that BISC is not a project for junior developers. So when you're not already quite experienced developer, best is also when you're already a Java developer. It's not the must have. We had some developers, C++ developers who have become BISC developers and it was not a big deal. But it requires, it's a very complex and very big project. So when you have never worked on a bigger project than a, in this complexity and so it might be too heavy. Uh, and there are the other developers. We don't have basically the resources to help onboarding with simple stuff. So when we see that people have big problems with just getting the application set up or the IDE set up, then it's a sign that it's basically not the right fit. Um, just one more thing uh, of a question that popped up in the group chat uh, on the monthly active users. Uh, we don't have um, specific numbers, but based on the downloads uh, that take place over each version, uh, it must be something between 11 and 18,000 monthly active users, I would say. That, that, that's my guesstimate on that. Uh, which, which, uh, which numbers do you t are you talking about? Downloads um, from the website? Uh, downloads um, in, in total, so f from GitHub. So the, the, the binaries? The binaries, yeah. Okay, so you, we can maybe add some to this number because, uh, for example, Arch Linux is a is a, a Git uh, checkout and then compile on the on the host. So there yeah. would be a few more. Yeah, so 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 probably somewhere between ten and twenty thousand might might be realistically. All right. Any other questions? I guess the, the takeaway is start small. If you're interested in contributing, we'd love to have you, but uh, start small, find a, you know, a small problem or issue or feature or whatever that you want to add or an initiative that you want to take. Uh, float the idea, get in touch with the people who are most familiar with that function and make the contribution, get compensated for it through the DAO, get a feel for how it works. We don't want anyone doing something and then, you know, regretting it later or whatever. Um, and yeah, just kind of, uh, I guess, weave your way in little by little. And that's the, the way to do it, I think. Any last minute questions? I would recommend again, going to that uh, contributor checklist for some details on where to go. I don't know if that's too far out of the scope, but many people have the problem when they make the first request, how much should they ask for in BSQ? I don't know if we should talk about this. Sure. Uh, maybe we can help a little bit uh, because uh, it's, yeah, it's a completely new concept, of course, in a normal job or so. Uh, it's, it's, it's a negotiation and here you are deciding yourself what you think it's the uh, value for the project. So the basic rule is, Everything what you work for BISC need to be visible somehow and need to be a value for the user. So when it's just work in progress, uh, it will not be paid. Only when the user can use it, which means when it's merged to master when it's uh, development work. Other stuff, we are, there need to be some documentation. When you make a video, when the video is out and available, then it's up for compensation. Uh, and then uh, the question how much you ask for, just ask yourself, how much you would ask for when you would do the same work for any normal company. We want to pay market rate, and I think some, probably we are even over market rate, and uh, just because it's open source project and you are 
maybe or yeah, a fan of the ideas and so it doesn't mean that you should earn less. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, and always think from the user perspective how much value has this added for the project. When you do something and it takes you one week, but at the end it's just a small thing, then maybe the one week effort is not really uh, representing uh, yeah, it, it would be a mismatch when you ask them for whatever, 5,000 BSQ, and for the user, maybe it has only a small value because it's just a small thing visible at the end for the user. But of course, for developers who are working then long on the project, there's many, much work which is not directly visible, like writing a test is not visible to the user, but of course, it improves the quality of the code, and that has to be paid as well. And I think then it's the best uh, guesstimate for you just to think yeah how much I would earn on a normal contractor base a freelance job for this work and then use this as guidance and then when it's too much or too low there's also when you make your compensation request on github you can ask people to give feedback or they do give feedback usually when it's uh, too high or too low and in the past it has worked pretty well there was more requests which were too low and other people told them, hey, that's uh, actually too low. You should ask for more like it was the other way around. And um, But it's a different thing like a normal company or a normal project. Yeah, and, and you, of course, you can also look at old compensation requests that were accepted, which were accepted. Uh, you can look that up in the GitHub um, issues uh, for in the compensation repository. Uh, yeah, and just use that as a guidance as well. Another rule of thumb, I think, is if you were going to do the same work as a freelancer or as a contractor, is another another way of thinking about it. If you have to learn, a, you know, a new framework or whatever to make the contribution, you're not going to charge for the time learning. You're going to charge for what you delivered. Um, so that's uh, sometimes a useful way of thinking about it. And can you hear me? Yep. And you can just look for previous uh, compensation requests that have similar work done for a reference. Yeah, certainly. Cool. Well, I think at least by the number of attendees, that was by far the most, uh, at least the, the, the biggest call we've had so far uh, on this. Thursday growth call. So uh, thank you everybody for attending. I hope you got something out of it. If you are interested in contributing, get in touch with us, follow the project, learn, see where you might fit in. And yeah, we'll uh, hopefully see you again in two weeks from now on our next BISC brief call. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Right, thanks, everybody. If any questions have not been answered, just repeat it on Slack or on the forum. But Slack is probably the best place. All right. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.